talk today is another slight experiment in the EuroBSD conference uh, concept. Uh, Stephen didn't submit his paper, we pulled it out of him. He's an invited speaker. Uh, Robert Watson suggested that this would be a really interesting topic, somewhat offbeat compared to all this BSD is the best thing and BSD is the second best thing and all this stuff we've been preparing all day. Um, Stephen's playing with computers and air gaps. This is, I think, really cool. Thanks for staying around, everyone. Here's a cop outline of my talk. I'm going to talk about clock skew. So I'll introduce some definitions of what I precisely mean by clock skew, show how this is linked to temperature, this will become clear later on, and also how to measure clock skew remotely. Then I'll show how the this technique can be used to attack the power and the network. And finally, I will discuss some current work on improving this technique and also some alternative applications. Another general lesson of this talk is I'm from the background of academia, and sometimes if you read an academic paper, it will read like I did A, then I did B, then I did C, and then I made this amazing discovery, can I have my Nobel Prize piece? Actually, this is not how science works. It's a lot more messy about this. So as this talk progresses, I will discuss how I actually got to the stage of finding the, the results that I published as if that was what I was meant to do in the first place. Here's what I mean by clocks. I don't mean wall clocks, although that's one example. I'm talking about a very general concept of just something that counts, something to do with time. These are constructed out of both hardware and software components. There's an oscillator. Um, this, this is driven by a crystal. Some, looking something like that. There'll probably be three or four in your average computer. And then this is connected up to a counter. Sometimes this will be hardware, sometimes it will be software, sometimes it will be implemented in the processor, that's the picture I've got here, or sometimes it will be a dedicated chip that counts every tick that comes off this oscillator. And as a sake of example, um, I'll mention 3DSD, they have something called the tick counter, it's a global variable called the tick. It runs at H stated clock speed. There's a very similar concept in Linux called the Jiffy timer, and this is incremented each time there's a timer interrupt. This plugs into the system clock. This is the one that will be seen to most user space programs. You get at this by doing get time of date. And one that I'm not really going to talk about is the BIOS clock. This is the one that runs even when your computer is off. Sometimes this is a dedicated chip. If you have an older PC, you might see a Dallas chip that's got an alarm clock on it. That's the real-time clock. In more modern computers, like the one I've taken a photo of, this is in the South Bridge. For the purposes of this talk, I'm interested in looking at the clock skew remotely. There's a very large number of ways to do this, but a few important ones are the ICMP timestamp request. This is where you can send the ICMP packet to a computer. If it hasn't been disabled, it will respond with the current time according to the get time of the system call um, at a millisecond precision. So that's running at one kilohertz. The disadvantage of this is it's disabled by default on a lot of systems because it's not that useful nowadays and it's a potential security risk. And also, in a lot of firewalls, ICMP will be completely blocked or there will just be some whitelisted <coughs> packets that are permitted. Another one, which is actually only applicable to Linux, or, well, it's not applicable to BSD or FreeBSD, which I've looked at. It is applicable to Linux. This is not normally considered a timestamp, but it works like one. This is because in Linux, when you're generating an, a TCP initial sequence number, you take source port, destination port, source IP address, destination IP address, hash them all together, and then add on a one megahertz counter. This is so that if an uh, initial sequence number is generated for that same host uh, and port triple later on, there's not going to be a collision. So this is from an RSC by Steve Bellman. OpenBSD uses almost a completely random initial sequence number. FreeBSD uses 
something that's inspired by the Melvin scheme for generating sequence numbers, but it's not exactly the same, and it's not good for getting a, a tiny stamp out of those. So the most general technique that I'm going to talk about, and this is where all my results are from, is the TCP timestamp. This is an option in TCP packets. It should not be confused with the IP timestamp option. In TCP timestamps, the host generates a timestamp. It's up to it how fast it is. In practice, you see between 2 Hz and 1 kilohertz. And it sticks this into every packet that goes out. The response to that packet will include that timestamp, so that allows a host to estimate the ground trip time. Another advantage of this is to create <coughs> sequence number wraparound on very fast networks, because sequence number is 32 bits, and that can wrap around, and the TCP timestamps allows you to tell the difference between two packets with the same sequence number. So that's how you collect timestamps, but now you've got them, what can you actually do about them? Again, I'm going to have to introduce a little bit of terminology. The offset is the difference between the two clocks. So the offset between this clock and that clock in the wall is when you subtract the two times. If they were perfectly synchronized, that would be zero. If they were off by some constant, then the difference, the offset between the two clocks would stay the same. But if this one's running faster than that one, then the offset will change over time. And this is what this graph shows. Each of these lines is a different computer, and each of these dots, which you can barely see, is a sample of me asking for, for a timestamp from that machine. And as you can see, that this host drifts down here. This host, which is over a transatlantic link, the green one, is more or less static, and then there's another three machine, uh, four machines that are going off in a different direction. This is interesting because a single computer will have a fairly constant uh, skew. Skew is the rate of change of offset. So it means you can, by measuring the skew of another computer, you can get a fair amount of information about that computer's identity. There was a paper from Yoshi Kono from uh, Canada and uh, so Yoshi Kono at the University of Washington and Casey Clappy from Canada measured this for a large collection of computers and they found that even if you have the same model of computer, the clock skews will vary significantly across them, um, up to 50 parts per million. But on one machine, it will only vary over the day by one or two parts per million. few applications of this fingerprinting technique. One is that you can identify a machine. If it moves ISP, it changes IP address, it's still going to have the same clock speed. Even if they change physical location and you've got no idea which ISP it was, when you see it again, you'll be able to roughly guess if it's the same computer. Similarly, if you have network traces, it's common for Measure, uh, for some network measurement techniques, you'll get anonymized traces of information being sent across the internet. They'll take off the IP addresses, but if you can find out the clock skew based on the TCP timestamp, then you'll be able to find out if you've seen this computer before. Another very neat experiment that Kodo has added was look at uh, virtual machines like the one generated by Honeybee. Honeybee generates a very large number of machines, so someone who's trying to attack that virtual network will think there's lots of machines and this is a big company and so worthwhile attacking. In fact, if you measure the clock skew of all these machines, it turns out to be the same, because they're all sitting on the same physical machine. And in fact, PunyD has now been updated in order to generate a random clock skew for all the different virtual machines. Another trick is if you have a NAT, Everything coming out of that NAT will have the same IP address, but by looking at how many distinct clock skew, the clock skew measurements there are, you can identify how many machines there are behind that. And one sort of um, aside, almost, that the paper mentioned was that clock skew changes over time. I mentioned one or two parts per million. 
and one of the potential reasons of this is temperature. But the paper didn't really go into very much more detail about that, and that's where I came in and tried to do a little bit, of, a little bit more work on that. So I mentioned that science isn't a red meat thing. I didn't think about the temperature thing initially at all. Yes? Is there a bit of a question now? Yeah, there's a... Uh, because you said that you can count the number of uh, hosts behind the net. You only get like five, six bits of, of, of information about it. So... Yeah. Uh, I mean, so it's not possible to count more than, what, let's say, 32 hosts? Or uh, on average, yes. But in pathological cases, where the machines diverge far more than you'd expect just by random, then you would be able to counter more. And that measurement of the five to six bits is for machines which were absolutely identical hardware. When you have machines that are different operating systems and different hardware, then they diverge more than that. So the way I came into this was not thinking about temperature was a good idea or even coming close to that. I wanted to do like better measurements than what the original paper on the box you mentioned did. I saw that they use TCP timestamps, which at best run at one kilohertz. But I noticed because of an entirely unrelated paper that TCP initial sequence numbers on Linux have a one megahertz counter. So that's a factor of thousand difference. So I thought using this faster counter, I could do better, and I tried to do that. And the results I got were just weird. I was expecting that I would start off with noise about that weight, and then it would jump to about that weight. Actually, I got an entirely crazy graph that had two peaks, and I puzzled for a while about why this was actually happening, and then looked into a bit more detail. And at two o'clock in the morning, the clock skew changed. Did anyone guess why? Is that what it's time to? It was Cron. Cron woke up and updated the Hastelocate database. That spun up the hard disk, and that warmed up the computer. And that was enough to be a measurable result. So I thought that was pretty neat, and decided to investigate exactly why that is. So this graph shows how the clock skew on the vertical axis changed with temperature, and the scale goes from minus 50 to 100 degrees Celsius. That's the specifications for the clock crystal that I looked at. And it is. <laughs> And it changes between minus 20 and plus 20 parts per million. So that's quite a lot. But on the other hand, computers don't go from minus 50 to 100 if you want them to keep on working. Certainly the hardest <laughs> would survive like that. So this is the same graph except I've zoomed in to where a normal PC will sit. And I measure a computer going from sitting in my office, going from no load down here, so about 26 Celsius up to the high load, and it only went up to 29. This isn't CPU temperature, this is a case temperature, because the clock crystal, which is actually being affected, is not sitting on the CPU, it's somewhere in the corner of the motherboard. And now the clock skew changes far less. Um, when I measured it, it's less than one, uh, but on different points of the crystal, these four lines, it can go up to around about one part per million. It doesn't sound very much, but it's measurable. So here's the same graph again. These are several different computers that I measured the offset for, and as you can see, they're diverging. But these look very close to straight lines, and the clock skew is changing. These wouldn't be straight lines. So you have to do something a little bit more clever. First of all, you take lots and lots of data, and then you take those lines that are up there, and then you shift all the points down by subtracting the linear component of the offset. And now you get a graph like this. The scale is far less. So in this previous graph, this is minus 20, to 20, and over a few minutes. On this graph, it's only going to minus 2, and this is over about 24 hours. And there's a lot, a lot more data in here, and you can see it's also very noisy. The, this noise is a problem, so we want to remove them somehow. And the obvious thing to do, which is also the right thing to do, is just draw a line over the top. So that's what I did. And this is the denoise version of the offset. But I don't want the offset, I want the skew. That's the slope of this set, each of these line segments and over time. 
In other words, it's differentiation. Differ, differentiation. Sorry. And now you have graphics. So you can see that it's the skew is gradually going up over here, and then the skew drops and then plummets down here, and then starts letting up. If you remember the clock skew uh, changes in the opposite direction to the temperature. And that's why I've actually flipped this axis. So this is high, high skew and this is low skew. And if we now compare this to the temperature, I put a temperature probe on this computer, you can see it's actually a pretty good match. As an aside, I looked into exactly why the temperature was changing at around about 8 o'clock in the morning, and it certainly wasn't because I was in my office. It turned out to be a bug in the building temperature controller. It's far too smart for a so good. What it does overnight is, this was in the summer, overnight it looks at how fast the building is cooling, but what it doesn't look at is whether any windows are open. So in summer, people leave the windows open, the building controller sees that because the windows are open, the building is cooling very fast. So then, around about 8 o'clock in the morning, it panics and thinks, the building's going to be really cold if the sun doesn't come up. And then, <laughs> and then it turns on the heating. So it turns on the heating, and then the sun comes up, and it starts panicking, saying it's going to be too hot, and it turns on the heating. So we're off. So, being a security researcher is a bit of a strange occupation. Once you've found something in weird, and that class finance is weird, you think, like, what can I break now? And I've been working at Tor for quite a while. It's a great project. They actually hired me recently. But I like breaking Tor. I've written a few papers in this, and I thought, I can do it again. So for those of you who don't know about Tor, it's an anonymization service. If you want to browse a website and you don't want to contract, you can use Tor to do this. So here is me looking at Google, and it so happens, and I prepared the slides a year ago, in this event. Um, it turns out that I actually come out in Denmark, in Google things, so in Denmark. Yes. It can do a few other neat things. One is that it can have host hidden websites, so-called hidden services. I'm going to talk about those later. But actually, most people use it for this anonymous web browsing facility. And also bit torrent. It works by taking your data, encrypting it under multiple layers, and then sending it through a set of volunteer Tor nodes. There's around about a thousand nodes now. Each of these nodes will take one layer off, look where the data is meant to be sent to next, and pass it on. And that means that the data coming into each Tor node looks different from the data coming out. What it doesn't do is introduce any de delay. For those of you who know about anonymous video premiums, they delay a message. If you did that for web browsing, it would be intolerably slow. Tor's already pretty slow. So it doesn't introduce any delay, and this makes it vulnerable to certain types of attack. So I mentioned about hidden services. I'll give a brief overview about how these work. The details are entirely important, but might be of interest. There are three stages to it. The hidden service up here wants to publish a website. They connect to a Tor node. Uh, chosen at random called the introduction point and makes a permanent connection to there and it sends that over two other Tor nodes so the introduction point doesn't know the real IP address of this hidden server. The ser hidden server then sends the address of the introduction point to the directory server. These are three or so computers run by the operators of the Tor network. Now time passes and the client <coughs> wants to access this hidden service. It connects to the directory server and asks, what is the introduction point for this hidden service? And it gets this back. Then the client connects to a node called the rendezvous point. This time the client chooses it over two Tor nodes and makes a permanent connection to that. And then the client sends to the introduction point, same one over here, the address of the rendezvous point and that gets passed on to the hidden server. <coughs> in the final stage, the hidden, servers, hidden service connects to the rendezvous point, makes a connection there, and the rendezvous point is still connected to the client, and they can now send data back and forth. After all this, the client doesn't know where the hidden service is, and also the hidden service doesn't know where the client is. 
So that's all good. That's exactly what you want from uh, hidden servers. And hidden servers are used for real data. One of the more high profile cases was there was a drug <coughs> called Zyprexia. And um, employee, probably, of the company who produces that drug released some documents which said that it had much worse side effects than the company was disclosing. And those documents have now been pretty much removed from the internet by the lawyers acting on behalf of the company who produced this. But they're still available on working services. So someone's using this to protect them from, at the very least, a uh, 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 very serious court case. So it's important to understand exactly how well Tor works. And first they'll be able to know if there are any weaknesses, how serious they are, and then if at all possible, fix them. So one attack on Tor is by Lasse Urdier from Norway and Paul Syverson from US Navy Research Labs. And it, the goal of this attack is to de-anonymize uh, hidden service. I mentioned before the connection setup. This is the last stage. And the interesting thing is this node over here is a randomly chosen Tor node knows the IP address of this hidden service. It doesn't know at this point that it's being connected to a hidden service. And it doesn't know what is the pseudonym of this hidden service that the client knows. But I mentioned the core doesn't introduce any delay in the data it sends. So the client who wants to find out the real IP address of this server can send lots of data and then stop for a little while, send lots of data and then stop. And if by coincidence this node is controlled by a malicious client, it will see the same pattern and then it will know that the pseudonym that the client is talking to it matches the IP address of the hidden service. Uh, there's 1,000 Tor nodes, so there's only 1,000 chance, roughly, that a given Tor node will be on here. But what a client can do is just keep on connecting, 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 until it sees the correct hidden service. And this works surprisingly well. Within 15 minutes or so, you can de-anonymize de a Tor hidden service. So Paul and Lassa came up with a fix against this, which is rather than this node, which is the critical one here, being chosen at random, it's chosen at random once, and then it's fixed for the lifetime of that node, which means that if, you, if the client starts making lots of connections, this one will stay the same. So if the hidden service is unlucky, and it so happens the first one that chose the so-called guard node is malicious, then it's lost. But otherwise, it should be safe. I have a question? Yes. Uh, how does the, uh, the marked tornado know that it is talking to the server and not another tornado? Uh, every Tor server is registered on the, in the Tor directory. So that means that the last node can see if the hidden server is also a Tor node. If it is, then maybe it just happens to be one of these other two. And if it's not, it's probably the hidden service. But even if it's the hidden service is also a Tor node, which is better in some cases for security, although I'm going to how it's actually worse, then you can just keep on trying. And two of the Tor nodes will change at random, and then one will stay, will stay the same. And that's the hidden service. So you might have to do it multiple times, but I mentioned it will work. <coughs> in that previous attack, I assumed that the attacker can snoop on the network, it can become part of the network. In the case of Tor, that's true, because anyone can join. But what happens if it can't? Now, let's assume that the attacker is entirely external to the network. It's, it can use it, it can send data through it, but it can't actually introduce any nodes of its own. The other scenario is that we have an evil web server, and then the victim is looking at a web page on that web server. The web server wants to find out who the client is, and the client doesn't want to leak its identity to the web server. What the attacker can do is send in a funny pattern, send lots of data for a few minutes and install, send lots of data for a few minutes and install, and do this over an hour or so. And then the attacker has another computer which simultaneously probes the latency of all the Tor nodes in the network. There's only a thousand or so if you want to bot net 
then that's pretty easy. And for this tar load, it will get an, another funny pattern back, and it's not the same. So it knows that this candidate stream going to the client is not going to this tar load. But if it probes this one, when the data that it's looking for is going through, then it will get the same pattern back. And eventually, over time, you can track whether a uh, given connection is going through a tor mode without even being part of the network. All you have to do is ping it, or maybe you can use tor to send data over to then watch how fast the data comes back. So that's the theory, but we actually have to try it. And here's one graph. On the top, whenever there's a gray bar, I'm sending some data. I'm being the victim, the uh, evil web server in this case. So here I'm sending lots of data, then I stop for a few minutes, send data, then I stop. And simultaneously I measure the latency going through all the Tor nodes, and this is this Tor node is actually transferring the data I care about. And each one of these dots is a latency measurement. And as you can see, when I send data through the Tor node, its latency jumps a lot. And this one is quite blatant. There are other nodes that we looked at which didn't have quite as good a correlation, but over enough time you can discover whether data has been sent to the Tor you're interested in. So this attack is pr pretty bad. It doesn't tell you who the client is, but it does tell you the path that the client took to the evil web server. So it would be nice to prevent it. And this is, it seems like a typical quality of service problem. The Tor server is so busy servicing one request that it's delaying all the other ones. So you can use a quality of service feature in order to prevent the attack. That is, that no, you set a rule that no stream going through a node can affect any other stream. This could be implemented by the Tor node uh, generating a fixed number of streams that it's able to handle. And for each of those have a maximum data rate and then accept no more traffic than that maximum. This also means that when one stream that is allocated, one circuit, is using less of this bandwidth than the capacity has been allocated, the server can't give that to any other stream because they can't give away uh, uh, give a measurable signature. It just has to sit there and do nothing. When it's doing nothing, it's not going to do as much encryption. And then it will cool down, and then its temperature, uh, its, its temperature will decrease, and then its clock speed will change. So that's the theory, but I wanted to actually try that. And it works, basically. Here's the graph. It's same graph, roughly the same graph as before, but I'll go through it. Again, each of these dots is one measurement of offset, and you can see there's lots of noise here. Then I draw the green line over the top of it to get rid of the noise, and then the blue line is differentiating that green line. And when I'm sending data to the core load, the blue line gets high, and then when I stop, it goes down. And this correlates very well with the temperature. For the purpose of the experiment, I can put a temperature probe in and see this, although realistically an attacker wouldn't be able to do that. I've just given one example of how you can use temperature as a core channel for an attack. But it's a communication channel that can be used for random inter-process communication. In some systems, there is a rule, and Robert mentioned about managing access control, that two computers, uh, two processes on that computer are not permitted to communicate. Say, for example, one is the top secret program that's processing satellite photos, and then the other one is a payroll application which has got lots of bugs in it and some key information to the internet. If those are running in the same computer, you want to make sure that no information can leak from the satellite photo, I mean, the satellite photo program down to the payroll program. One way of defeating a measure like this, if you close off all the standards communication channels, is for the high-level process to signal in some unconventional way. Back even in the 1970s, it was realized that if you use up lots of CPU in one, type, well, in one process, then the other processes are going to be starved. So to send up one, the top secret program can use up lots of CPU time, and then the payroll application will recognize that it's getting very little. If it wants to send a zero, the top secret application will run very low amounts of processor time, 
and then the payroll application sees that it speeds up. Consequently, there's a defense against this where you allocate every process a particular time slot and you don't allocate that to any other process even if that process isn't using it. This reduces efficiency, but it eliminates that covert channel. But this is similar to the case I just described. When that time slice is not being used by anyone, the CPU will go down and other program can detect it. It needs a time source to act as a reference block, and this could be something like NTP, or if it can be accessed network, it can just compare its own measurement of time to another clock crystal in the machine. I mentioned that a PC might have up to half a dozen clock crystals. One is on the SIM card. It can just compare its own perception of the time to the SIM card, and it sees a change, it knows the temperature is changing. Another case is crossing air gap security boundaries. So air gap security boundaries are supposed to be basically impenetrable. If you don't want two computers to communicate, you have you put them in the separate points in the rack. But heat rises. If one computer warms up, then the one above it is going to do a change in temperature as well. And we've had confirmation from um, another person, um, Harrison Grundy, that he can cause a three degree temperature difference by warming up the computer below it. In the case of a blade server, you might be able to do even better because then you've got very tight cup thermal coupling between each of the blades. To confirm this, I looked, um, I will have a set of blade server. So instead, I took a desk lamp up here and put it inside of my PC case and then turned it on and off over two hour periods. And you can see that I'm getting a corresponding oscillation in temperature. And also, I can detect this using clock scoop. I hope just bring more. I try to make it better as well. And another attack against Tor is if you take over enough of the Tor network, again it's only a thousand Tor nodes, like that's tiny and bottom go, then there's a good chance that one of your servers will be both the first and the last call on the Tor connection. Then you can do the same trick as before, you correlate the amount of traffic coming in with the amount of traffic going out, and then you know who's going to who's going to where. So this attack has been known since the beginnings of the onion routing project back in the Department of Defense. So when the 30 tornadoes came up, all on the same two slash text teams, people started getting nervous. Then they did a trace route to them and found that they're all in Washington, uh, code of the FBI or near FBI, CIA, places like that, and then people were really nervous. Uh, and also, how many people can get two slash sixteens? Yes, some places have Cambridge has got two slash sixteens, MIT's got a slash eight, but your average ISP doesn't. So a lot of people started investigating them, and uh, I knew about this temperature cover channel thing, so might as well apply here. And these are six measurements I got from the thirty tor uh, thirty tornadoes, and. I can learn two things from this. Firstly, there's the real, the, app, sorry, the constant skew between all these machines. So I mentioned that in the Kono et al. attack, machines can diverge about 50 parts per million, even if they're identical model. In the cases of these six computers, they were all the same. And also, you can see that they're changing in the same pattern, which means that they have the, they're roughly the same environment. So based on these graphs, you can guess that they are the same machine, and almost certainly they were. Another way to confirm this was I tried SSH into them, and being very wise, they blocked SSH. What they didn't do was block SSH from localhost, and these are tornadoes. So you make a path to the tor network from a node to itself, and then it's behind the firewall. And then you can log in. I, I didn't try to get a password, uh, probably illegal. But I did get the host key, and it was the same for. Actually, there are two host keys over the <laughs> <with> team computer <laughs> team. So, based on all these tricks, we can guess that there are probably only two computers here, and they're not virtual machines because they're all the same, the, the same uh, 
was the, in fact, there probably just one machine with multiple IP addresses and then tours down to each of the IP addresses. So we did a lot more digging and found out actually who was running these. And it turned out it wasn't the Spooks. It was just someone who thought that he really liked Tor and one Tor would be good, so 30 Tor would be great. And he actually realised that he was causing a problem for the user. So this problem is now being fixed. And the person who ran these nodes asked me not to say who he was. But <laughs> Did you get the V uh, uh, Sorry? The V? The Spice 60s. Uh, He's one of those, the types of people who isn't a spook who does have a um, large number of sign of IP addresses. <laughs> 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 so so I'm all fat on your line. Yeah, uh, there's lots of people with universities and places like that get tipped on the door. That wasn't good. So this is pretty crazy, but we can actually go a bit further. As you know, for any of you who have come from warmer places, temperature changes depending on where you are on the earth. And also it changes over the day, although not the fact that it's realized by the building controller in my lab. So based on the temperature, and which is collected through clock screw, you can roughly guess when sun rises. And all these lines are when sunrise was on that place of the earth. And also the length of day changes depending on your latitude. So based on the temperature, the length of the day and when the mid midday or sunrise actually occurs, you can roughly guess there's something that's. I haven't tried this, but if anyone wants to do the source codes on the web page. <coughs> An obvious problem with these types of attacks is what happens if the server is running NTP? Uh, in practice, this isn't much of a problem. Firstly, NTP changes the clock very slowly. If it starts to change it very fast, then as soon as one NTP packet is being delayed, then it will jump dramatically. Although over time, NTP will destroy any absolute skew between computers, which will defeat the fingerprinting attack, when the temperature changes, it will change faster. It can often change faster than NTP can adjust it. This introduces some problems when you're trying to measure it, but in fact, you can bypass any of these problems by just using a different type of clock. So while IC and P timestamps are under Linux adjusted from by NTP, TCP sequence numbers aren't. And that's for a very good reason, because if you start adjusting your clock, then sometimes the clock will get slower, or sometimes it'll get faster, or sometimes it'll jump. And you don't actually need that for TCP timestamps. Um, FreeBSD is pretty similar, but I think of any way drink. But it looks like ICMP timestamps are NTP synced, but TCP timestamps come from the interrupt controller, so aren't. Um, all TCP sequence numbers, as I mentioned, are randomized, so not particularly helpful for trying to estimate clock skew. So if NTP doesn't help, what can be done? What can be done better? Well, you can block timing information. You can block TCP timestamps and so on, and that will defeat some types of attacks, but it's not going to affect things like the packet interrupt timer. When a TCP connection detects that some data has been dropped, eventually it will start resending that, and that comes after a timer interrupt. And if the timer interrupts are being adjusted <coughs> by NTP, which they up, then you'll be able to detect that. Another thing you can do is keep on running the CPU at full load, no matter what happens. This is pretty inefficient. Um, and also, I noticed that depending on exactly what you're doing with the CPU, the texture difference will change. Uh, for example, um, there's a program called CPU Burn, which will cause a very big difference in the temperature. But actually, just doing crypto doesn't increase it as much. You can install a temperature compensated crystal. This has got a little temperature sensor on it, and then adjust the clock temperature. <coughs> this might not even be good enough because the specs for these show one part per million accuracy, and temperature introduces a smaller difference in that, and can be detected. If you want to go one level up, you can get uncompensated crystals. These have a um, um, little heater in it, and try to keep a constant temperature. These work better, but they're very expensive, and they're also quite power hungry. And I'm using a different set of slides than
Yes? Okay. You have to this one. <coughs> so I mentioned that there's I mentioned that there's lots of noise in these signals, and here's another graph. And in fact, this graph is a good case. Here you can see that this band, the quantization noise. Now, this comes because not clocks don't have infrared precision. They actually run down the timestamps. So when you ask for the time, you'll get it, there'll be a slight amount of inaccuracy. The other source of noise is network jitter. Sometimes packets will be delayed, but in cases like this, it's the quantization noise that's a, a big problem. So let's go into a bit more detail on this. So the quantization noise of a sample depends on how close that sample was to a clock edge. So imagine I think that my watch is a little bit too fast or too slow. So I ask someone, um, what's the time? Now, if they tell me accurately, I'll be able to guess when the time's that out. Uh, guess the difference between my clock and their clock, and then correct it. But now let's suppose that um, I think my watch is <coughs> five minutes either too slow or too fast. But the person who's going to help me isn't going to be that much help, and they will, then they will just tell me if it's before or after five o'clock. Now if I asked quarter of an hour ago, then regardless of how fast my watch is, they would always give me the same answer, and it would be no use, no use to me. So what I should do is wait till it's almost, I think it's almost exactly five o'clock, and then ask them the time. And then depending on whether they ask, uh, whether they think it's before or after, they'll give me a different answer. So the overall message from this is that the closer this is to the clock tick, this is a sample, and this is a clock tick, this is the clock increasing over time. The closer the sample is to one of these lines, the lower the error is going to be. So this is a, another graph of the amount of noise that I get. This width is the quantization error. So this, in the best case, I can get a one kilohertz clock, and that has a period of one millisecond. In some other operating systems, the, the TCP timestamp clock is 250 hertz. So in that case, the end of that bar will be somewhere over here. But other clocks, for example, the one in the HTTP timestamp is one hertz. So that means that the noise will be a few, um, a few hundred meters over in that direction. And that amount of noise will destroy the types of measurements that I'm doing. So some work that um, Sebastian Zander has been doing with me is trying to reduce this noise by asking the question at the right time. This is just what I mentioned before. If you want to ask someone the time, you ask uh, either when you think that their clock tick is going to happen. So if they tick at one hour, in case of someone who will tell me um, whether it's before or after there, I should ask almost at that, at that point when um, they're going to change their answer. And we can now compare the amount of noise we get with these blue dots. These blue dots are intentionally as close as possible to the clock ticks. And you can see here it's a little bit after, and here it's a little bit before, and then the noise is much lower. And this is basically what the <coughs> technique that Sebastian and I worked on um, does. The algorithm works by the, it first works <coughs> along the timestamps and it sends out packets um, at sequential times until it sees a clock tick. And then it goes roughly when that clock tick is. It knows roughly when the next one is going to be. So it tries to get before and tries to get after. If it guess, guesses right, then it can start guessing um, much closer to when it thinks the clock tick is. But if the guess is wrong, for example, it sends one with, when it thinks it's before and one when it thinks it's after, and it turns out both are before, then it whitens that error and then starts guessing again. And over time, it will start converging on the correct value. And this is the graph of noise we get out, and it's much more than samples are extremely low, and pretty much everything, all the noise here, is caused by the network jitter. And this is almost, uh, this is almost independent of the clock frequency. So even if you have a really slow clock, like the one megahertz HTTP clock, then you still get very good noise quality. 
<clears throat> so, in summary, tincture over channels are a viable attack. In theory, they should all work, but actually, when you try it, it does. I give an example of when you can track Tor head services by warming up the server and then measuring the result by the clock skew. And also I discussed some other ways that it's possible to use tensure core channels in situations like multi-level secure systems, um, even crossing air gap security boundaries in um, closely thermally coupled racks or blaze servers. I also mentioned about a more general message that is true not only in the case of these examples, but in other areas of our research. No one thought that temperature was a security critical quantity. And if you look at a system that's secure in the, the abstract that the designers were thinking of, when you start introducing more into that abstraction, you start to find additional attacks. So if, even if you have a system that you think is secure, start thinking, I know it's a uh, very common phrase, but think outside the box. Think of weird things that someone might actually try. It probably won't work, but maybe it will. And it, turns out, it may turn out that the system you thought was perfect it is not as good as you might have thought. Any questions? Yeah. How, how long does it actually take to say fingerprint a machine for this method? If you're just trying to fingerprint between the uh, number of candidates rather than fingerprint as temperature, it can be tens of minutes. In the case of temperature, it's closer to overnight. Because although we can get fairly clever techniques for removing the noise, actually, the smaller amount of time that you run the experiment, the, the smaller the difference and absolute difference between the two clocks, and network jitter starts becoming a problem. So you're realistically looking at errors, if not the day. Any attempt to reduce the measurement noise? Mm -hmm. You realize that you actually use these, uh, DSP technologies to do that because the theoretical uh, quantization error is a uh, rank function. And you have a number of samples of that which correspond to over sample. So if you fill in the blanks with non measurements and run an FCT, uh, FCT on the fast forward transform, you actually get the base frequency with very high precision and you get the phase relationship. And you can do that with very few samples. Yes. So you still need to sample at the right points. Because yeah, you but then you'll know where the right points are. Yes. So the, the system that Sebastian's been looking at is, it might actually be the same, it takes the same as what you're describing, because it's a PLL. Yeah. And it's the piece of loop. Yeah. So, but yeah. Um, Sebastian has been doing most of the work on this. Uh, I suggested the idea a while, a while ago, just as a <laughs> I say in one of my papers and then he'd been working in some fairly advanced control algorithms for making this work. And hopefully you will put code online soon as well. Have you tried displaying with Diplos kernels to see what that does to your measurements? No, I haven't. Uh, that would be interesting. Uh, I think we only really looked at Linux properly. PBSD looks pretty much the same, but Diplos kernels would be very interesting. Well, you can make use Diplos kernel some much of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the, on, on your kernels, uh, you don't need to patch only on, on AMD 64 and the patch. A little bit. Yeah. Um, can you comment on why you said it was proper and not enough to use the top uh, green one uh, above your uh, gray dots? Uh, yeah. So, So in the case of this graph, if the temperature wasn't changing, you would have a smooth line at both the top and the bottom. But when you start measuring over a large link, then you start having network jitter. And the reason you choose the top line is because in the top line, network jitter is zero up here. But in the bottom line, there's actually loads of points off here. So there isn't a clean bottom line, but there is a clean top line. So you don't have a plus or minus, you have a plus. <coughs> yeah. Variable plus. Yes. Because you, you can't get a latency less than zero, and that's why you get the clean top line. Mm -hmm. 
but they can save you all the settings when you're going across them on your reserves. Think outside the box. <laughs> <laughs>